very much. And thank you to the organizers for focusing on such an important um, issue. Um, my emphasis for working on this project was the recognition of the centrality of water to all life, not just human life, but all forms of life on this planet. And I think that water serves as an important centering point for thinking about what the future of life on this planet looks like. Water has served as a central element of both Christian and Islamic ritual from the very beginning. We have water that is present before God's creative speech in the Bible. Uh, the Quran refers to water as an ayah, a sign of uh, God as the creator, the halik of the universe. And it's intended to orient us uh, toward the divine. Water appears in both the Bible and the Quran as an expression of punishment and reward, of blessing and curse, of salvation and destruction. And we know that both Muslim and Christian populations are impacted in different parts of the world by water shortages and by water oversupply. Lack of regular access to clean and safe water supplies, damage to water systems from inadequate or non-existent stormwater drainage and runoff that is filled with silt, fertilizers, and other chemicals. We live in a time of accelerated melting of Arctic and sea ice and accompanying rising sea levels, and we are facing an expanding climate refugee crisis as larger and larger portions of the planet become uninhabitable due to either expanding desertification drought and diminishing water reserves, or <laughs> opposite side flooding and even submersion into the ocean. Because Muslims and Christians constitute more than 55% of the global population, we have the majority stake in determining equitable access to water and clean water management. And so what I am trying to do in my work is look not only at the intersection of um, information and perspectives uh, that we can gain from science and looking at ethics, but also looking at what I'm calling the interdiscursivity. How do we bring science, ethics, and theology together um, so that we're not talking past each other, but that we are engaged with each other, bringing insights from all of these different disciplines um, together. And what theology contributes particularly uh, is thinking about water as God's gift to all life in a way in which, means through which, God interacts with all forms of life in ongoing ways. It allows us, you right. <laughs> we're missing my slides, unfortunately, um, but hopefully those will be available to you afterwards. Uh, a means through which we can think about God interacting with all forms of life in ongoing ways, and using our combined insights to offer us a vision of a transformed human relationship with water that acknowledges the impact of human choices, whether these are driven by selfishness and greed uh, that lead us to conflict and division, or if we can think about them in the spirit of stewardship and khilafa, uh, uh, which sometimes has been translated as vicegerency, but I understand that the terminology of khilafa is under much discussion. Um, in the Muslim population at present. And so I prefer to leave that as a multifaceted term. Uh, but the hope is to bring these together to protect and conserve water for all life forms as expressions of worship and respect for God in the form of ibadat, um, and also as caring relations between all living beings. Muamala um, typically we think of as relationships between human beings, but there is um, material in the uh, Islamic legal literature that expands that beyond human beings to thinking about other uh, life forms, including animal and plant life, um, and especially thinking about the promotion of the common good, maslaha. I think it's important to do this um, because drinking water in particular is increasing in scarcity at the same time that water demand and water use increased ninefold during the 20th century uh, alone. Access to a regular, clean, safe drinking water supply has been deemed the sixth sustainable goal by the United Nations as of 2015. Um, and the hope is to achieve this by the year 2030. In the year 2021, a UNESCO report documented 5.3 billion people, 71% of the global population, have this kind of access. However, that access varies throughout the year, such that an estimated 4 billion people, which is over half of the global population, experience severe water scarcity for at least one month out of every year. And there are over 2 billion people who continue to live in countries that experience water stress. 
we know a great deal about um, the human uses and abuses of water supplies. Um, what I would like to particularly highlight uh, is that there are certain populations who are more negatively impacted uh, by abuse of water. And this includes women, particularly girls under the age of 15, uh, who live in water scarce locations, who can spend as many as four or five hours every day fetching water. And the time that is spent fetching water comes at the expense of their education, their ability to engage in microenterprise, their ability to participate politically, their ability to rest and engage in major activities. Um, and it also increases the potential for physical and sexual assaults. So that this issue of access to water isn't just about the water itself, it's also about surrounding um, social conditions. In the United States in particular, we also have poor communities and communities of color that are often intentionally selected as locations where toxic waste landfills, dumps, incinerators, and other undesirable byproducts are actually intentionally chosen uh, for uh, these locations because these are persons who are lacking in resources and power in the political systems. Um, and so many of them live surrounded by polluted water resources, contaminated tap water, and pay higher prices uh, for water at a time when they have less means uh, to pay for it. The strongest impact, therefore, of declining water uh, availability is really on Sorry, those. You want to right. Did you want to move on? I, I was looking to see, just not quite yet. Um, okay. I wanted to get to this point of fresh water really being a, a point of justice um, and uh, the common good. And so I want to think about water as a theological imperative. I only meant move on in your slides, not in your talk, obviously. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So we have uh, water as a theological imperative. And I've been thinking about this because we have abundant data. We have a lot of scientific knowledge. We have warnings that come to us in the news every day about the gloom and doom that is facing the planet. Um, we have political and economic statements about water scarcity. We know that we need to conserve water. We know that the global change in the human relationship with water has been very difficult to achieve. And the result of that is that many people feel very stressed and anxious about threats to and from disruption to the water cycle. But that stress and anxiety do not seem to be enough to make people do something about it, to make them act upon it. And so that really, I think, is the ultimate challenge where religion may be able to help us turn the page. We know that the problem exists, but knowing doesn't seem to translate into doing. And so the hope with this methodology of interdiscursivity is to build upon the information that science brings us. It's not intended to be an alternative to science, but to engage in it and to intersect with science bringing religion's ethical insights and the inspiration and determination for transformation that science has not been able to harness up until this point. Science tells us what is, what has happened, and what is likely to happen if people do not change their ways. In religious terms, we might think of that as a prophetic warning and call. Religion invites us to meaningful consideration of relationships and connections to encourage us to think of our treatment of the created world as a reflection of our relationship with the divine. And so from that perspective, whether we're calling it a climate crisis, a climate emergency, or now even climate chaos, we can consider this a spiritual and moral crisis and an opportunity for transformation, not just an economic, political, or social reality. We need to think about water in different ways. Our ongoing failures to spur concrete actions um, suggests that we need to think about what water really means as the ultimate source of all life. It's not just a transactional commodity to be bought, sold, consumed, wasted, and thrown away with no regard to its moral or spiritual significance. That instrumentalization of water and monetization in the form of ecosystem services tends to suggest that water, which is a priceless gift necessary to all life, when we commoditize it, it suggests that it has no value outside of what human beings decide that it has. Um, and so if we think about water as a way to shape the moral conscience by approaching climate chaos 
perhaps in the terminology of thinking about our current moment as a moment of decreation, running Genesis backwards rather than forwards, um, but that might take us, bring us to a point where we can think about our role as human beings. What does it mean to think of ourselves as anti creators <coughs> rather than stewards or khilafa of God's um, creation? We can think about um, the natural world as a book of creation, a series of ayat from God that are intended to reveal something of God's self to all life forms and to point us to something that goes beyond ourselves. So I have a series of slides that outline um, a variety of uh, resources uh, from the Quran and from uh, the tradition, uh, looking at different ways in which uh, water is presented. Um, that it is, uh, it serves to represent God's authority over all of creation. It is present at the creation of the world as the primordial and primary element um, at the origin of every living thing through divine intervention. We find the presence of water in stories of many prophets and messengers. We can look to stories in the Hadith, stories such as Hajar's persistent search for water um, that resulted in the revelation of the well of Zemzem and looking at her gift of crafting a reservoir for the water that flows from this well. And the purpose of this well was that no individual or person or even country was ever expected to claim ownership of it or possession of it. It was God's gift freely given. And if we think of it in that way, it would allow us to think of water as a sign that points us toward God and is intended to establish a meaningful relationship between the natural and the human world. We can look to examples of uh, water as um, punishment or a source of blessing uh, in paradise. Uh, there's a wonderful parable uh, that appears in the Quran about uh, two men who were uh, raising vineyards and one was very proud of himself for all of the wonderful ways in which he developed uh, to produce more uh, from his land. And the other man was willing to work with whatever God was willing to provide. And the ultimate lesson of this parable is that when we are grateful for what we have and we recognize God's gifts to us as those gifts and are willing to work with that in a sustainable way, we may not have as much money or material possessions at the end of the day, but we're able to live in a way that is faithful to God um, and sustainable with the rest of our surroundings, as opposed to exploiting everything we possibly can in a particular moment, getting as much profit as we are able to in the moment, um, but at the expense of our relationship um, and our placement within the picture, rather outside of it, um, with the natural world. We have many uh, examples that we can draw from uh, from the legal literature as well. Thank you. Um, a sharia itself points us uh, to uh, the water. And so we have many theological lessons about water uh, that we can draw um, with respect to justice, uh, the common good, uh, thinking about our relationship and the unity uh, to all reality uh, and the balance of nature. Um, if you are not uh, familiar with it, I would invite you to uh, take a look at the Islamic Declaration for Climate Change that was issued in response to uh, Pope Francis's encyclical, um, Our Common Home, uh, with many resources available. Uh, similarly, for biblical uh, and Christian resources, the most important one that I would point to uh, is the idea of sacramentality, um, the natural world. That this is a way in which God uh, reaches out to us and provides us with grace uh, in an ongoing way. And as with the Quran, we have water present uh, from the beginning of creation uh, up through all of time. Uh, since there will be a panel speaking about Jordan later this afternoon, would invite us to consider Jesus's baptism in the River Jordan. We have this wonderful moment where the divine is present, standing in the middle of the water. We have the earth on both sides, and the river banks. Um, what would it mean for Christians in particular if the Jordan River were to run dry? If we lose access to this very central point of Christian faith and belief, if baptism in the manner of Jesus becomes no longer possible, how much of our connection to the divine and our connection to our sacred past would we be losing in the process? There are many theological uh, lessons that can be uh, drawn from Christianity. Um, 
as well. <coughs> but this slide will be made available um, online sure. uh, for all the details. Um, but perhaps the most important point is trying to put it all together. I'm thinking about the aspects that Muslims and Christians share. Both faith traditions teach that water is a sacred gift from God, a miracle in creation, um, offers us the potential for blessing and punishment, for giving life, but also for taking life away, as you've seen most horrifically uh, with the rise of hurricanes and extreme weathers um, and flooding uh, in Pakistan, which at one point was one third under water uh, for a long period of time. Um, a sign of divine activity in the world, but also a reminder to us that uh, punishment also can come with that when we abuse the gifts um, that we are given. Um, and perhaps most importantly, that both traditions call us to recognition of water as a gift. Um, papal encyclical Laudato Si calls humanity to a relational approach to the environment rather than a transactional one or one of domination or stewardship. Um, and so as we bring uh, all of these uh, points together, um, there are stories that we can look to uh, in the Bible and Quran to uh, read together. I would point particularly, as I do in the longer version of the paper, um, to the story of Mary's childbirth um, in the Quran, uh, where water is made to appear to her, to comfort her and care for her in these most vulnerable uh, moments. Uh, we have the story of Hajar, uh, presented in the Bible, but important in the Quranic tradition as well, where um, God provides for her in her, um, in her uh, moment of need, um, and also to think about Jesus' encounter with uh, the Samaritan woman um, at the well. So many possible resources, um, and hopefully a reminder to all of us of the value of all life, not just human life, as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.